fiscal year 22 budget, which we're in the throes of, we're also doing some program budget reviews to help uh, um, inform our decision making for the future. So, so far we have uh, heard presentations and engaged about our school operating fund in October, the staffing standards and standards of quality in November, and then instructional services department was in January. So today we're gonna continue with the department budget reviews and that's with the Department of School Improvements and Supports. So you may recall that um, DSIS, School Improvement and Supports was established last year in fiscal year 21, which is our current fiscal year, by converting the Office of School Supports to a department and assigning selected other offices as the responsibility of the Department of School Improvement and Supports. So those operational changes were all done using existing resources, but it is for all intents and purposes, a new department. So the mission of that new Department of School Improvement and Supports is to provide data-driven supports to schools through a region-based approach to increase student achievement, student access, and student opportunities. So I'm going to turn it over to the Assistant Superintendent for the Department of School Improvement and Supports, Mr. Mark Greenfelder, who will get us started. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate everybody's time today. Good morning, everybody. Um, you, you, you stole my introductory line and did it much better than me, so <laughs> thank you. Um, but I'm Mark Greenfelder. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for the Department of School Improvement and Supports, and I'm excited to be with you here today to um, present our first um, budget review uh, for our new department. Um, it's been an exciting year. Um, I'd be remiss if I did not uh, you know, specifically thank Dr. Brabrandt for his support in creating this office, but most importantly, the board for seeing the vision of this office and really bringing it to fruition. I know it's been discussed for, it was discussed for many years and to see it come to fruition um, and the results we've already achieved and the impact we've had, I think has been um, really great. And I know when we bring students back um, with some of the anticipate, anticipations around um, learning and some of the things, uh, missed opportunities that we've had, um, the work of this department is gonna be uh, greater than ever and we are certainly ready for the challenge. The Department of School Improvements and Supports is made up of four main offices. The Student Activities and Athletics Programs Office, uh, led by Bill Curran. The Office of Assessment and Reporting, led by Beatrice Huffman. The Office of School Support, both elementary and secondary, led by Jennifer Lemp and Stephanie Gerald, and the Office of Non-Traditional School Programs, led by Kate Salerno. Together, we work to ensure that all schools are accredited and that achievement gaps are closing. The achievement gap work, again, will be more important than ever as we move forward, and that has really been a new focus for our office. We will help students find success with other opportunities outside the traditional school model. And we provide a variety of activities and athletics to meet diverse talents um, for all our students. And one exciting development of that is we'll be working with Dr. Williams and Dr. Presidio to find alternative activities and athletics for many of our high school students that don't necessarily participate in the traditional sports and activities. So that is uh, some upcoming work we will be doing this summer. Um, one other uh, important note, just as we go through, um, I know in the um, ISD presentation, um, there were some zero-based budgeting um, offices uh, that use that process. Um, this is a new department, um, as Ms. Marin stated, and what we're going to be doing is following Dr. Presidio's lead, and as we go into the future, so next year and in future years, you will see a more, uh, an approach that is very consistent with uh, Dr. Presidia's vision and uh, aligned with ISD in terms of providing a more zero-based um, approach. So I did wanna, wanna put that out there so that you all knew that. One other thing, and everybody knows I can go on and on and talk and I'm gonna try to be quick today. Um, the presentation is maybe a little bit more lengthy and I know you guys like to get it in 30 minutes or less and have time for questions. We're gonna try to do it as good a job as, as that, of that as we can. We're probably gonna go a little longer, keeping in mind that this is four separate offices that do have some very distinct um, responsibilities and, and they're, they're quite different. And I think it's important for 
uh, the board, um, especially given the past year and not having um, maybe had other presentations around these offices to get a little bit more global overview of what they do and then some of the specifics of their budgeting requirements. So I did, did want to put that up front. But again, we'll try to go as quickly as we can and be as um, responsible as we can to the time. Next, please. So with that, you know, we did want to focus on equity at the center and the Department of School Improvements and Supports is grounded in the belief that equity is the center of all we do. This is the work we do and why we came into being. Each of the four offices in the department addresses equity on a daily basis to ensure that students are at the heart of the work. We're already, as I mentioned, leaning on Dr. Williams and her expertise to help work with some of our offices, and we will not only have some additional training for our staff and coaches, but we are working with Bill Curran and Dr. Williams to look at providing uh, this summer and into next fall a robust equity model for our student athletes. Um, and I think that's really critical as we go forward is not only what are we doing for our staff in terms of staff development and work around equity, but how can we help create uh, some training modules for our students and certainly our student athletes um, on the fields of play. And that's one, one of the exciting developments we'll be working on over the summer. You know, I think of equity at the center and I think back to the very beginning of Project Momentum and, and then the creation of Office of School Support. And really, it was our foundation. And for us and for this department, it's not different work or more work. And that really is my favorite bullet. It's the work. It's what we do. Um, Project Momentum was originally created in the Office of School Support to level the playing field for all kids. And we did a heck of a good job for you know, four and five years when we really focused on that, of uh, working with some of our most at-risk schools and really creating a much better playing field and much better tier one instruction for those students. And now the challenge is how do we use a regional-based approach to really take that and expand that to all schools? And that's going to be the great work ahead. It's the work we need to do. And I believe that in future years, it's what's going to define us as a school system. Next, please. So when we get to the budget, um, and when I looked at this at, at the beginning, it was kind of a little funny, because um, we're that tiny little olive green slice that's the 0.2% of the budget with $4.8 million of our operating budget. And um, I think some people might be, why are we spending time on 0.2% of the budget? Well, it's a pretty impactful 0.2% of the budget. And I think as you we go through this morning, and you hear the work of these offices and, and the work they do and how they directly impact students, um, it, will, it will present a compelling case of the great work that we do. As you can see, we uh, represent, again, 0.2% of the budget. We have no managed funds um, and our department staff supports approximately $45.3 million of other school funding. Next, please. So you can see the various offices and what their designations are. Again, the Office of Assessment and Reporting, it represents approximately 1.9 million of the funding. The Offices of Elementary and Secondary School Support represent approximately 1.4 million. The Office of Non-Traditional Schools is 0.8 million. And the Office of Student Activities and Programs is 0.6, and then the Assistant Superintendent's Office for School Improvement and Supports is 0.3. Um, please note for rounding, it doesn't exactly um, add up, but it's really close. So that's the that's where the $4.8 million um, goes. Our budget supports approximately, supports 43 positions, and then an additional 354.5 positions out in schools. Next slide, please. So, my particular uh, office, the Assistant Superintendent of School Improvement and Supports, we have a 1.0 Assistant Superintendent, a 1.0 Executive Administrative Assistant. Um, we have a 1.0 Financial Analyst that we traded for for this year and a 1.0 Project Support Coach. The Financial Analyst, um, when the office was created, uh, we took over uh, non-traditional schools and, and programs and they are very heavily reliant on grants and other um, financial means. And so 
we needed to make sure we had the financial expertise to uh, really keep in line with all those grant requirements and also to bring the other offices into uh, making sure that we're financially compliant with everything. And our project support coach, that is primarily the person that works with BDOE and make sure that we're in compliance. Uh, that person works and gets all the trainings from v VDOE. That's our primary liaison um, with all school improvement and supports. And again, does all the project-based um, activities, uh, graduation, um, all the different things that our office is currently working on right now. Um, as we uh, move forward, you're gonna hear from each one of our directors. Uh, that's going to specifically talk to you all about what they do and how their uh, op specific office uh, functions. And at the end, we will certainly uh, be available to answer any questions. So with that, I want to start off with our Office of School Support, which is led by our directors, Stephanie Gerald and Jennifer Lemp. Next, please. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Lemp. I'm one of the directors in the Office of School Support. And good morning. My name is Stephanie Gerald, and I'm the other director in the Office of School Support. We would like to thank the members of the school board for your time today. The Office of School Support was created as a solution to support schools that were struggling to meet full accreditation with the Virginia Department of Education. Uh, at that time, that we were uh, first beginning, FCPS had more schools in warning or in jeopardy of being warned by the VDOE than ever before. OSS is likely best known for our work with Project Momentum schools and our success partnering with schools in Project Momentum has allowed us to grow over time and expand our support division-wide K through 12 in both academic and non-academic areas. The budget we will discuss today supports the hardworking staff in the Office of School Support. These staff make up region teams who work side by side in schools with leaders and teachers as they implement best practices for high quality instruction, develop innovative systems, and collaborate in professional learning communities that optimize collective efficacy and improvements in student achievement. Next slide, please. As Stephanie mentioned, the positions listed here and discussed today in our budget really help to make up these region teams that support schools kindergarten through 12th grade across the division with a specific focus on best practices and in instruction, closing achievement gaps, and on-time graduation. Members of these region teams support school leaders with data analysis as well as with school improvement planning. Region teams also support leaders with classroom and collaborative team observation, feedback, school-wide professional development planning and facilitation, as well as their MTSS systems and practices. Our office works to support teachers and teacher teams by building their capacity through job embedded coaching and professional development. We work with teachers and teams to plan instruction, analyze assessments, and refine those practices. Members of our office support by modeling lessons and co-teaching side by side with teachers. We observe instruction, provide feedback, help improve the instructional experiences for students in Fairfax County Public Schools. Our work has always really focused on providing direct supports with schools. And during the 1920 school year, at least 175 schools received support or attended professional development led by our Office of School Support staff. This year, even though our work has looked quite different, 198 schools have already received support from and or attended professional development from members of our team. Our work has changed significantly as a result of the pandemic and OSS has responded flexibly and shifted our resources to best need the, meet the needs of the division, schools, and most importantly, students. In addition to continuing to support schools, we collaborate daily with our central office colleagues to create instructional resources for teachers to use in virtual and concurrent learning environments. Next slide, please. The elementary and secondary office budgets are primarily utilized to staff the positions you see listed here. In addition to the budgeted positions you see listed in black ink, 
Positions in blue indicate staff that are funded through sources outside of the operating budget, including IDEA grants, Title IIA, or Project Momentum. Next slide, please. The work of OSS is deeply embedded in the strategic plan. Our MTSS team provides research-based training on classroom management techniques, and they work collaboratively with our partners in DSS to, in order to really minimize the number of student disruptive behavior referrals. Our data managers and specialists support schools in gathering and analyzing data, monitoring interventions and tracking student progress. Our elementary and secondary content resource teachers with their exceptional pedagogical content knowledge. They work together to really ensure students are successful in reading and mathematics. And our MTSS team, educational specialists, data team, secondary resource teacher teams, they support schools to identify students in need of instructional, behavioral, and attendance support. And they employ systems for monitoring and tracking student progress in an effort to really work toward ensuring that all students will graduate on time and leave FCPS college or career ready. We do much of this work with a focus on building relationships with the school leaders and with teachers. Next slide. This school year, the MTSS team joined the Office of School Support. And as you likely know, a multi-tiered system, system of supports is a systematic framework that provides support to schools with developing systems data and practices in the areas of academics, behavior, and wellness. Our MTSS team helps schools, help school leaders and teams organize their staff, utilize data, and put best practices in place to meet the needs of all students. They provide training and resources and work collaboratively with the Department of Special Services and Instructional Services to ensure schools have access to resources and support across all tiers. The MTSS team works with central office colleagues to develop and facilitate professional learning in the areas of classroom management, social emotional learning, content area instruction, grading, and attendance. Next slide, please. Our offices have resource teacher positions dedicated to support K through 12 mathematics, K through 12 literacy, and elementary science. Our ESOL and special education resource teachers work alongside classroom teachers and teams to help ensure that the appropriate scaffolds and supports are available for all students in these content areas. 177 schools were supported by those resource teachers during the 2019-20 school year. And so far this year, 192 schools have been supported. This support includes, but is definitely not limited to one-to-one -to -one support with teachers, supporting collaborative teams with planning, providing intervention and remediation to groups of students, developing distance learning and virtual learning resources, and facilitating job embedded PD, such as lab sites and large scale PD on things like courses on number and operations, advantage math recovery, metacognition, kindergartners learning about print, literacy symposium, the 5E model and inquiry-based science. Additionally, our mathematics, language arts, and science team members have made a significant contribution to the central creation of the teacher resources that were and continue to be developed to support teacher workload challenges during this time. Next slide. One of the most exciting changes uh, or evolutions to the Office of School Support over time is the addition of a secondary team and they were created during the 1920 school year. Their work with schools has been instrumental in moving forward the division aspiration to ensure that all students graduate on time and are college or career ready. One major focus of our secondary team is on-time graduation. During the 1920 school year, 13 high schools received support from our on-time graduation team. And so far this year, 17 of the high schools have been supported. On-time graduation support includes side-by-side -side coaching, consulting, and data support for school leaders, including SOSAs, DSS, counselors, and deans. Our staff work closely with principals, assistant principals, instructional coaches, and department chairs. Further, they spend a significant amount of time building the capacity of the new on-time graduation resource teachers that the division provided for in nine of our high schools facing the greatest challenges. 
we want to thank the school board for approving the funding for those positions. These staff focus on ensuring that our most vulnerable students are getting the support they need to graduate on time from Fairfax County Public Schools. Next slide, please. As we shared with you when we presented to you in November, we have seen positive outcomes from the collaboration between members of our office, the regions, the school leaders. The Office of School Support Budget is used for the human and fiscal resources that are used to directly support schools. Decisions about how both human and fiscal resources are used are reevaluated each year and really even continuously throughout the year. For example, each year we look at state testing data as well as division data to prioritize schools. We understand that fair is not always equal and therefore some schools will need to receive a greater amount of support than others. The way we reevaluate and shift supports has worked. Some of our successes can't be measured by numbers, but they are so clearly visible when you walk into classrooms and see those strong instructional practices and some outcomes are clearly measurable and really show improvement when we look at the standards of learning assessment data. In 2014-15, there were 18 schools that were accredited with warning by the Virginia Department of Education. That number continued to decrease as those schools received strategic and consistent support by members of our office. You might notice that rise in the graph noted in yellow for the 2019-20 school year. That's the year that VDOE decide, began to measure the non-academic indicators, and that helped impact, impact our decision-making for the human and fiscal resources and led us to add the secondary team, as Stephanie described. Next slide. Our staff work collaboratively to develop instructional resources and facilitate professional learning in order to promote equitable access by supporting schools to develop high quality learning environments, increase opportunities for enhanced engagement and participation, use data to inform decision making, and create systems of support and processes to meet the needs of all students. We truly value our collaboration with our central office colleagues who work in other departments. We've worked to break down silos and align support between departments. One of the silver linings of the pandemic is that it required us to collaborate in an authentic and meaningful way, unlike, we have, unlike how we have had to in the past. With Dr. Presidio serving in the role of Chief Academic Officer overseeing DSIS, IS, and DSS, we have the ability to collectively create more equitable outcomes and access for all students in Fairfax County Public Schools. Next slide. The Office of School Support has a history of success in working with schools to improve instructional outcomes for students. Not knowing the extent of the impact of this pandemic, we are anticipating an even greater need to, for support to teachers and students in the years ahead. Now more than ever, the Office of School Support will be needed as our system recovers from the impact of the coronavirus. Moving forward, our work will be to ensure that we strategically support schools to increase equitable access and outcomes for students by examining data, employing MTSS systems and practices, utilizing evidence-based intervention strategies, and working side-by-side -side with classroom teachers to support best practices in instruction. Each and every member of our staff funded by the budget plays a critical role in student success. Our staff have the knowledge, skill, experience, and a proven track record of success. We have strong working relationships with our central office colleagues, school leaders, and teachers, and together we will continue to make a difference for the students in Fairfax County Public Schools. We want to thank you for your time today, and now we will turn it back over to Mr. Greenfelder. Thank you, Jennifer and Stephanie. We appreciate uh, your great work with that presentation. And if we could go to the next slide, I would like to introduce Ms. Betris Huffman, who is the Director of the Office of Assessment and Reporting. Betris, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Greenfelder. And my appreciation also to the board this morning for this opportunity to share about the work of our Office of Assessment and Reporting. The Office of Assessment and Reporting previously was known as the Office of Student Testing. And our office is responsible for all of the division assessment programs 
and also accountability reporting uh, to ensure that our division fulfills both our state responsibilities and our federal requirements. When people think about our office, they usually think about the role leading assessment. And that role is definitely the most visible and has the most direct impact on our students and our families and teachers. But it's no less critical than our role in preparing and managing data and reporting for strategic plan and accreditation outcomes, as well as state reporting. To better reflect that scope and the two sides of our responsibility, our office was renamed in July 2020 from the Office of Student Testing to the Office of Assessment and Reporting. And we joined at that time the Department of School Improvement and Supports. The next three slides, I'll be sharing an overview of how our office uses our 1.9 million in operating budget for positions and direct and indirect services for student staff and leadership. Next slide. The office's operating budget is allocated for two main objectives. First is to support schools to implement their division assessment programs. And second is for central processes for student data outcome management. The majority of our funds go to staff salary and benefits to carry out those two objectives with 17 budgeted, two traded, and one part-time hourly position. To better understand how those central staff impact schools and division goals, I'm going to take just a moment to walk through a couple of examples of the work. Staff listed in the left-hand column at the top of the table, uh, together with our two traded positions, um, are overseeing our division policy and implementation for assessments. For example, the test administration specialist and the traded school support resource teacher develop resources and provide professional learning and technical support for school-based staff to understand the purpose of assessments and approaches to carry out assessments in their buildings. That team supports one budgeted assessment coach in each of the 28 FCPS high schools and at least one non-budgeted school-based test coordinator in all of our other schools and centers across the division. Staff listed on the right-hand side of the table, together with the part-time hourly position, provide operational support for assessment processing and data management. For example, our psychometrician and data specialists generate division-wide data analysis and reporting for student outcomes in strategic plan goal one. That work allows for interpretation and conclusions by division leaders to support continuous improvement. Another example is that our assessment operations supervisor and assistants who work out of the Johnny Fort Support Center handle physical test materials and data record management needed for testing accommodations, processing student records, and online assessment systems. Looking at the remaining budgeted funds, you'll see again that the majority, around 200,000, goes to um, school level resources with professional development, test management tools and resources, uh, and the other 100,000 for central supports, things like software and technology that are needed for our data management and reporting. Next slide, please. If we explore specific responsibilities within our office, we can see that the work is very tightly aligned to strategic plan goal one. We directly generate goal one metric data through schools, um, such as administering SOL and WIDA assessments for the reading and math metrics. In 2019-20, before school closures, school delivered about 120,000 SOL and WIDA tests. We also, indirectly support other central offices with goal one strategic actions, such as on-time graduation. For example, again in 2019-20, high schools provided over 30,000 PSAT and work keys exams that serve as alternate routes to verify credit for graduation. Beyond administering assessments, the office uh, develops data analysis and reporting tools and helps staff to understand student outcomes and support decisions about next steps needed for continuous improvement towards strategic plan targets. Next slide, please. To close, um, the Office of Assessment and Reporting approaches our decisions, our guidance, data, and our school support through an equity perspective with a focus on doing what is best for students. 
This focus was heightened to a new level this year with the challenges in ensuring equitable opportunities and experiences across virtual and in-person learning environments. We worked with schools and program leads to reduce testing requirements where we could and to require, ensure that um, the time that is spent testing provides instructional value. We also explored where virtual testing would be an option and have offered schools guidance in delivering uh, virtual assessments. So far this year, uh, over 30, excuse me, over 300,000 virtual assessments have been delivered in schools. Additionally, we've collaborated with school leaders to develop logistics guidance and tools to carry out in-person testing in our virtual, um, excuse me, in our uh, social distance environment. And um, during the first three quarters of this year, schools gave over 57,000 in-person assessments using scheduled appointments. Of course, as we go through the rest of the school year with more of our students attending in person, those in-person ass assessment experiences will not rely on appointments to the same degree. And additionally, our teams are collaborating across departments to highlight curriculum embedded classroom assessments, reinforcing the importance of ongoing meaningful feedback for students. Lastly, um, an important component of our focus has been leveraging Virginia Department of Education flexibility that's designed to mitigate barriers that come from the ongoing pandemic. Uh, to continue, uh, we're engaging stakeholders across schools and departments to identify how we can best take advantage of SOL waivers, scheduling options, and communicating families their increased choices for testing. We're also aggressively working with schools and other departments to make sure all eligible students are benefiting from graduation flexibility options, including emergency guidelines for locally awarded verified credits and some waiver opportunities. In closing, I wanna note that all of the efforts that um, within our office have been enhanced by our move into the Department of School Improvement Supports this year where we've been able to maintain a dedicated priority for school and student equity and stakeholder voice. And at this time, it's my pleasure to turn things back over to Mr. Greenfielder. Thank you, Ms. Huffman. And we will uh, move on and switch to Mr. Bill Curran, who is our Director of Student Activities and Athletic Programs, and he will take you through that. And then we will finish up with our non-traditional schools. Hi, good morning, everybody. It's good to see everyone. We're going to jump right in and keep moving forward. In uh, the Office of Student Activities and Athletic Programs, we uh, have five central positions. The, the director, that's me, our specialist who oversees primary responsibility is transportation and, and clubs, but really has a hand just about in everything that we do. Um, our athletic training program administrator overset, oversees the athletic training program as well as the AD program and some uh, lots of other functions. We have the middle school after school program administrator, and we have our administrative assistant. Additionally, we have um, school support or position supported, and we have an operations technician. Really, a uh, huge part of that job is overseeing the AED program that is in every one of our buildings, as well as the, uh, the helping support the HR program with regards to licensure and CPR requirements that were recently placed in the last few years. Um, the vast majority of staff is, goes right to the schools and supports the 25 traditional high schools with the director of student activities in that office that includes a full-time certified athletic trainer, uh, 0.5 assistant director of student activities, um, a full-time administrative assistant, and then a supplement that offsets uh, an additional athletic trainer in each one of the schools. Um, we also have some hourly folks in our office. We have um, an individual who oversees our synthetic turf field support and maintenance program that makes sure that we keep on record and, and keep on track with maintaining those synthetic turf fields um, in a partnership with the park authority and the county government. And we have a player safety support individual who helps us um, with our coaches and our, our coach outreach, as well as our player safety initiatives that we do. Um, ultimately, that totals about 113 and a half positions that are supported system-wide. Uh, through the activities and athletic programs office centrally. Next slide, please. The vast majority of the, the budget that, uh, that goes to the activities and athletic programs goes to directly support 
um, our schools. And, and in that, it is a direct support. Um, the four main areas that we encompass as far as what we fund are the officials fees. So every regular season officials fee is paid centrally. Schools aren't responsible for that. Um, we cover that, those invoices at a central level. So everybody can play the same amount of games. We have the same game limitations across the board. And uh, that allows for equity across our school system. We also cover all the transportation costs for regular season as well as postseason. Uh, postseason is on a uh, ultimately a, a worksheet that we do together with the schools to make sure we can support our schools going. So no one is funding transportation directly out of their out of other funds for both regular season and postseason um, activities. We support the safety any safety equipment that's required. We recondition all safety equipment such as helmets and shoulder pads and other protective gear and we do that on a higher frequency than is required by uh, the national standard. We do that to ensure that our individuals are, um, we maintain the highest level of possible safety equipment that we can. We also, any new safety equipment that's required by rule change is also covered by our office. We don't want schools to have to make decisions around financial pieces when it comes to those things. So we make sure that protective gear, particularly when it's brand new, is covered at, through, this, through the uh, central office. And we also cover the police and uh, event safety at our public events so that we have uh, the support of those functions and officers when we need it. Ultimately, this is a bit unusual if you look across the state as well as across the nation on how athletic programs are funded um, at school, most school divisions. Most school divisions will provide a budget to a school but then leave it to the individual school. We practice it this way in order to ensure that we have equity across the board, that our schools all have the same amount of opportunities within a regular season. Um, and aren't looking to, to where they would trim corners around safety or anything else, and, and we're able to support what we have. Uh, and it ensures that that's done on a regular basis. We also are able to maintain that um, cycle with regards to reconditioning and upkeep of our safety equipment across the board and ensure that that's happening at the right schedule. Next slide, please. Uh, Within the Student Activities and Athletics Office, we, we connect with the strategic plan. We have 800 unique clubs that are offered across the 25 traditional high schools. Um, that averages about 300 clubs a school. Um, some are very similar, some are very different. When you get down to it, they, they cross all sorts of boundaries um, with regards to what they are from academic activities, career activities, cultural activities, faith and fine and performing arts activities, food activities, forensic activities, games and hobbies. Um, honor societies, interest only activities, language, literary, you name it. Um, if a student can think of it and find a sponsor, pretty much we'll move it through. Um, it's really student led and we, we uh, look to that and our students to, to see what, what it is they're interested in and bring it forward. We have visual arts activities, you name it. We intentionally um, don't track attendance in that. So it's really hard to say how many students, although we know there's a very large number of students that are involved in activities. Um, in our schools, but we don't track attendance because some of these are very sensitive in nature and we've heard it's much better and, and we've seen it in practice that our doors are open and that our students come in as appropriate and that they feel comfortable with doing that. And so we make sure that we keep that as open door policy as we can and allow all our students to come and go. Um, over the past 11 years, we've averaged about 27,000 athletes participate in sports per year. Um, some of these student athletes are counted multiple times. So if there are two or three sport athletes, they'd be counted two and three times. Uh, what you do see is what's really interesting is when we boil down those numbers to see what that comes down to a little bit more, you see our highest multiple sport athlete percentage is in our schools that are most diverse, which is, a, is an interesting st statistic and a really neat thing to track. As you see, our more diverse schools have students involved in multiple sports and really engaging within the school, which is, a, I think, a pretty neat thing. And, and we continue to take a look at that and how we can support that more. Um, and it works out real well. We offer 25 sports across all the, the schools, all the same sports across schools um, are offered and funded. Uh, there's sub varsity of pretty much every one of those programs. Some is defined, some of that's defined as junior varsity and freshmen. Some of it's defined as sub varsity, such a track. You have a varsity track program, which scores but then you run ultimate heats with anyone who, who's there and it's very, very open. We also offer three club sports within Fairfax County Public Schools that are not funded. What a club sport is, is essentially not funded. Sometimes there's confusion around that. Um, specifically that's crew, rifle and freshman field hockey. Um, freshman field hockey continues to be recognized by the Virginia High School League. So it's a place to really grow an opportunity 
for our young women who are coming in in September at the beginning of the school year to participate in a sport that oftentimes is very, very new to them. So we, we look forward to that piece as, as we go and really have seen growth in that area. Um, there's also ac academic activities which are recognized by the Virginia High School League. These include theater, scholastic bowl, forensics, debate, robotics, film festival, creative writing, publications evaluation, and multimedia contests that go across all the boards that are judged um, contests through the Virginia High School League. Our work directly supports the FCPS strategic plan um, through lots of different ways that we do it. There's community service components within most of our programs that are led by the coaches and our students in areas that are specific of interest to them. And um, one of the things, and we can go to the next slide, please, uh, that we're really, really proud of is, is we link um, the portrait of a student athlete to the portrait of a graduate. We worked through our uh, coaches advisory committee to really develop what is it we wanna see? What is it, what's the purpose with regards to a student athlete and a student that's involved in our school? And how does that link back to um, our strategic goals and what we do? And we see that in this work that was fully created through our coaches advisory groups that we've engaged with over the last few years to, to provide a direct linkage to those students who are involved and active, which is, is really a great linkage. And we wanna see every one of our students involved. Um, what you see here, and I'm not going to read through the whole thing for you, um, but this has been regarded both on a state level and a national level as a standard that, that everybody wants to meet. Um, I, I keep talking about it because I can't tell you how proud I am. It's, I'm beaming with pride of what our coaches did on this work with relation to how they feel their work with their student athletes and all the students in our building go to developing those core values that we want to see within a portrait of a graduate and how we want to move things forward as a portrait of a graduate. Um, all right, next slide, please. Ultimately, everything we do is we have the equity focus and equity lens on it. Um, from a, a, a funding standpoint, we look at that with what we cover, which is that officiating and reconditioning of safety equipment athletic programs, because we want to provide as much of an equitable opportunity across all 25 schools as possible. And we believe we do that by covering, covering those costs so schools aren't having to play less or more because of where they are. Um, and we provide support to all the traditional high schools to ensure that basic level of operation is, is conducted across um, through the traditional high schools. And the ongoing focus on gender equity through Title IX is always there. I can tell you, and, and Mr. Greenfelder mentioned it at the beginning, a, a thank you to Dr. Williams, really for the, the work we've been able to do and, and started doing with regards to um, equity and cultural responsive initiatives that we can do with our student athletes, our staff, and our coaches. Um, I really believe that's, that's a great next step that we're moving towards. You saw a lot of our colleges and universities starting that work. We we're able to start some of this work last summer and have, have really put a focus and a lens on that moving forward. Um, next slide. I think that's it for me. Yep. And with that, I will wrap it up. Thank you for your time. And Mr. Greenfelder, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Kern. Appreciate uh, all your efforts and work. And this time we will bring it home with non-traditional schools school programs with our director Kate Salerno and we'll try to get through this last part uh, quickly and then uh, open it up for the last uh, 45 minutes to an hour for any questions or comments that you may have. Thank you Mr. Greenfelder and good morning everybody. My name is Kate Salerno and I'm the senior administrator for the Office of Non-Traditional School Programs. My position is one of eight office positions and my role is to direct, plan, manage, and coordinate homebound and home-based instruction, as well as the school-based non-traditional school programs. I'll share more information about both of these in the next few slides. This office supports 190.5 school-based full-time positions such as school administrators, teachers, instructional assistants, and support staff. I'm supported by an administrative assistant and an educational specialist who provides direct instructional support to all of our full-time and hourly instructional staff members. For our homebound program, there is one manager and one educational specialist supported by three business operation assistants. Next slide, please. The non-traditional school programs provide a caring and inclusive culture where all feel valued, supported, and hopeful. The non-traditional school programs embrace and are supported by the Kids at Hope cultural framework. We believe all students are capable of success, no exceptions. We believe in assigning students an asset label, kids at hope, as opposed to a deficit label, at risk or at risk youth. 
our equity focus is to elevate voices who have been marginalized. Next slide, please. Homebound instruction is provided to students unable to attend school due to a medical or psychiatric need. Homebound instruction is mandated by Virginia Code and home-based instruction is required as a part of the special education continuum. This includes the hiring and the deployment of teachers, ensuring students have equitable access to instruction and collaboration with schools in preparation for their return. Last year, 220 hourly teachers and six full-time school-based special education homebound teachers provided almost 17,000 hours of homebound instruction and just over 5,000 hours of home-based instruction in the home or healthcare facility. Last year, even with the closure occurring in March 2020, 758 students were supported and served. Um, if you have time, you are welcome to view our short video in your board docs to see how we utilize technology to support student learning and well being when they're on homebound. Next slide, please. There are 13 types of school based programs at 32 geographical locations in Fairfax County. Programming can be found in every region. We have non traditional school programs on the campus of some of the regular high schools. So students can access our programs in a smaller, more individualized environment as needed, and the student can remain enrolled in their school and close to their school community. We also have non-traditional school programs in community locations for those students needing a school program away from some of the large schools and other programs that are located in county agency spaces through cooperative agreements with those agencies. Our office provides guidance and support to the two alternative high schools, Bryant High School and Mountain View High School, even though they report to the assistant superintendents of regions three and four respectfully. Some of our schools are on programs are full day programs, while others are shorter and more flexible to accommodate work and or parenting schedules. The pathway to high school completion for some students isn't always an easy one or a straight line. Sometimes the choices and decisions students make interfere with high school completion and can become overwhelming and sometimes seem hopeless. We seek to engage and inspire and educate all students. We provide oversight to the school in the Juvenile Detention Center, which is funded through a Virginia Department of Education grant, as well as the Fairfax County Adult Detention Center. Educational services for special education eligible students in the Fairfax Adult Detention Center are mandated. We provide educational services to students assigned by a judge or a probation officer to court-sponsored residential settings. While these enrollments may be low, eight, 10, or 12 students, each of those students are a kid at hope and they are valued. We meet students where they are and where they need us most. Last year, just over 2,100 students were served at these schools and programs. Over 700 students were served at the two alternative high schools and 321 youth were served at the JDC school that has an average daily population of 35. Next slide, please. We embrace diversity and we are diverse. Our demographics for our school-based programs are on the slide. While you're looking over the demographics of our school-based programs, you might be asking yourself, why does FCPS have so many different types of non-traditional school programs? Well, that's an easy answer. A one-size-fits-all approach to education does not meet all students' needs, and the same is true in alternative and non-traditional programming. Some of our students have enrolled and transferred within the non-traditional school programs multiple times until they were able to find the right academic and social-emotional fit. We employ an open enrollment environment to support students when needs arise. Our programs have reached out to our base school colleagues to identify any students who currently need a smaller, more personalized learning environment as they're returning. Next slide, please. On this slide, I'm sharing some data from last year. 39% of the requests we received for students were for students to re, uh, for grade 12. 76% of the students that attended a non-traditional school program last year attended at the request of a parent or a student themselves not as a result of the hearings office or a court assignment, but
but rather as a result of life circumstances. Perhaps they are their own breadwinner, or they're an older English learner or a newly arrived English learner, or a student who may be experiencing severe anxiety or having academic or behavioral difficulties, or a pregnant or parenting teen. 87% of the 12th grade students graduated with a diploma and 50 students earned their GED. 93% of the 12th grade students who accessed homebound or home-based instruction graduated with a diploma. Equity does not always mean equal. Our students deserve first, second, and third opportunities, and sometimes this requires more resources and more staffing. Smaller classroom environments, lower student-teacher ratios, and more individualized or personalized learning. Our service level is by name and by need. And again, I encourage you to take a look at the video link that I provided. Next slide, please. Our aspirations are that all non-traditional school programs provide a caring and inclusive culture where all students feel valued, supported, and hopeful. All students are capable of success, no exceptions. And all students will graduate on time, college, or career ready. Again, another link there to take a look at our collaboration with George Mason Universities for our dream catchers opportunity for our graduating seniors. Next slide. While we all know that educators are special people, our non-traditional alternative school programs would not and could never be what they are without our amazing school leaders and our super special instructional and support staff. I'm really proud of them. I'm more, I am more than proud to share with you that the Fairfax County Public Schools 2020 Outstanding Secondary Teacher of the Year is a teacher in one of the non-traditional school programs at the Transition Support Resource Center on the campus of Bryant High School. He's a US Navy veteran, and in his own words about his mentor who encouraged him to become an educator, Mr. Brewer says, she showed me how I could give back to my community and make a lasting impact on young people. The first time a student told me, you've saved my life, I knew I couldn't be anywhere else. I believe God puts people in your life for a reason and puts you in the right place for the season. Mr. Brewer's message to all educators is, embrace the moment, accept the challenge, uplift the situation, and dust off the most tarnished student you see every day. And that's what we do. And thank you so much for your time. I'll bring you back to Mr. Greenfelder. Thank you, Ms. Salerno. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to just in closing, uh, because I know we've gone over a little bit, as you can see, this is four very distinct offices. And to, to rush through it, I don't think would quite do justice to the work that they do. And also to give you all an overview of the complexities of each one of the offices. So uh, with that, we'll uh, conclude our presentation and open it up for uh, questions and uh, next steps. And we appreciate all your time today. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much. That was a lot of information. And you know, you are a new office, so it's understandable that you want to try and tell us as much um, as you can about what you've been doing. So, so thank you. And um, you know, we're using Zoom for the new time for the first time, and usually on Blackboard, it's a little easier to discern the order of which, but had five members raise their hands during the presentation and I was watching the presentation, not realizing the orders. So what I'm gonna do is just go in alphabetical order by first name. And so um, I'll just read that order just so everyone's aware. So it would be um, Elaine Tolan, then Ms. Corbett Sanders, um, Mr. Carl Frisch, Ms. Megan McLaughlin, and then Ms. Sizemore Heiser. And now I will see who pops up after that and we'll continue on from there. So um, if each person can have up to three minutes, let's keep it tight. We have till 1245. So first, Ms. Tolan, followed by Ms. Corbett Sanders. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and um, in addition to the, the in-depth presentation, I also want to thank you for the um, document that you put together that's also out on board docs. It goes into even more depth on um, each of the, the parts of your organization. I had a number of questions. I think I'm going to start with um, probably the um, Office of Assessment and Reporting um, because I'm very interested in, you know, as we move forward, you know, out of the pandemic, um, how are we really, um, you know, how is your office involved in, um, 
different types of assessment. I know you had a section on that curriculum embedded assessment, for example, um, in the in the narrative report. How are how are we really looking at different types of assessments? Working with staff on these assessments for um, the fourth quarter and then into next year to um, get a handle on you know where our students are academically and socially emotionally and then and figuring out what do we need to put in place in order to you know catch up or fill in any holes or gaps that we're seeing that's the big question and then as part of that um, is there an opportunity um, to utilize some of the one-time um, COVID-19 funding that we may have over the next couple of years to, to bolster that um, assessment activity and the reporting that would go along with it. I'll start with that. So thank you, Ms. Bellum, for those questions. Um, to start with the curriculum embedded assessment and the different types of assessment that our office has been working with um, back from really last spring and then into the summer, um, our office helped to set up and lead under the direction of our new chief academic officer, Dr. Presidio, um, an assessment working group, assessment program change working group under that um, return to school task force structure that was um, implemented long ago. And with that we engaged across the departments and across schools principals, teachers, and other um, leaders within buildings to help inform us what was needed. Um, and the curriculum departments, um, together with their resource teachers in the Office of School Support, who are actively engaged in that work, um, developed a number of short, quick assessments that tied specifically to the um, revised curriculum that was rolled out this year, the, um, the streamlined curriculum for return to school, so that we could ensure that we did have assessments that would specifically address what was being taught, what was identified as essential standards, and most important for helping students both be ready for ongoing success, but also to be able to measure that progress as they go through. So those assessments have been in place throughout the year. They look a variety of ways. Some of them are more of that traditional format, multiple choice and so on. Others are more performance-based assessments. Part of our work, particularly as we moved into the fall, was to look at portfolio assessments and other performance tasks and how that those opportunities for students to demonstrate beyond the more standardized format were was really important, particularly in our virtual environment to allow students to demonstrate their learning. So we are really focusing on a balance of assessment types and embedding those assessment types within their students' course so that testing is not a discrete event, is not a separate activity, it's part of learning um, and the feedback that students can get from those experiences support their learning. Um, so that's that's part of the answer. I'm sure there's more, but I know that time is tight. Your other part of your question was around, um, around funding. And I would have to actually um, connect with our experts in the finance um, office, finance department, and um, the, the grant leaders who are supporting those specialized um, 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 pandemic funding sources to see what opportunities might be still available. Many of those funds, as you know, have already been allocated for specific, mm -hmm. um, but certainly if there are funds that have not been allocated, um, that, that would be something that would be fabulous to have a way to further develop those resources. Thank you. All right, thank you. Is that it, Ms. Um, Dolan? Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Please go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, I would like to maybe, and maybe I'll put that as the next step, look at that funding question, because I would anticipate that some of the work that you're doing um, will be uh, increased because of um, COVID-19. So there may be some potential there. Um, one, I, I, question, I had a question for Mr. Curran. Um, when you have such a large number of you know, high school um, clubs and activities, how do you um, look at, um, you know, are those 
the, are there new clubs or different activities that should be offered for the students that are there? Is there a way besides just a student coming forward and, and requesting um, a club? I'm thinking in particular with our changes to um, admissions for Thomas Jefferson, um, then we may have students in our base schools now that are going to be looking for, you know, activities or clubs or, you know, competitions that, um, you know, perhaps are not offered currently in our base high school. So how, how can we really watch and make sure that we're offering what we need to be offering? Really, as far as the club side of this goes, it's driven by our students. So if our students have an interest in a club, it's, it's an application process and, and the ability to make sure we have a, a staff member or a sponsor. Um, there are times we get some of those questions around, we would like to have, uh, you know, can we have this, can we have that? And we look for those opportunities to make it happen. Um, you know, athletics is a little bit more tricky with regards to that piece of it because there's some, some liability and, and space and time and things like that. With regards to the clubs, the reason we have 800 and growing, that's not a stagnant number as it grows, mm -hmm. is as, as things change, as an individual school or an individual student has an interest, they can bring that forward. And they can bring it forward through the school, um, they can follow that process. Here's what we want. Here's where our interest is. We'd like to take that piece on our next step. And it's student driven. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure if I got the full answer. Yeah, it looks like Dr. Ivy has something to add. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I have been working um, along this year with the principals, and um, particularly middle and high, and they have shared with uh, me that actually, um, even though we were in a virtual learning mode, mm -hmm. we've had, um, they have really been able to increase the number of, of participants in clubs and have been able to increase the um, options for clubs based on student requests. And, um, uh, you know, while we're, you know, moving back to in-person, um, that has been one of the pluses of, of when we were out in, in um, distance learning and having um, many, many more students participate virtually. Now, we could get you some further info on that if you would like. Yeah, um, I was well aware of that in talking to um, my middle schools in particular. Mm -hmm. So I'm really hoping that as we move forward, even as we go into in-person learning, that you know perhaps we'd be creative about still offering some clubs and activities in a, in a virtual setting. Um, because particularly, I think students that you know have transportation issues or you know things are right. uh, you know it's harder for them they can participate virtually in these clubs and activities and, and they've been great um, yeah. for that. So yeah. I so think that is on the radar and that's something we can continue to, to talk with them about. But I know they're very interested in doing exactly what you said because the more they can participate, the better. Right, and I think I also see that tying in at the middle school level with our um, discussions that we're having about increasing um, you know, young scholars and you know, uh, access to some of the more advanced activities around STEM, you know, and having more of our students prepared for even you know applying to TJ or you know or other opportunities. So I think there's some things we can take advantage there. Yeah, agree. Um, thank you. Um, I think I had just one other quick question. It's not necessarily budget, but I noticed. Um, in OSS, we've got, you know, the three of our four core areas represented, and I don't see social studies, and I was just a little bit curious why um, we don't have um, that resource teacher support for social studies. Sure. Um, actually, several years ago, when social studies was a part of accreditation, we were able to have a social studies resource teacher on staff. And as things shifted, we needed to make some really crucial decisions about supporting literacy. And as we continued to see that literacy was such a critical area, what we really had to do, and this is an example of one of those like decision-making around our fiscal and human resources. Um, at that time, knowing that we were had so few um, staff members, this was way back when we only had about 20, um, we, ended up using that resource teacher position who was highly qualified in literacy to help support our neediest schools 
with their literacy instruction. And so that really helped to guide that. Um, we are open to the idea of having other people in the future, but of course that would depend on some fiscal resources as well to be able to add to that. And right now we know that a lot of the teachers who are looking for some support in social studies really are looking for how do we um, help kids to read the text, uh, access the text of social studies. And so we're able to support them in that way. Thank you. That's, sure. that's it for my questions. I'll, I'll turn it over to the next um, board member. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Next, we have Ms. Corbett Sanders, followed by Mr. Frisch. And um, um, for the clerks keeping track, thank you for tracking both the board's time and the staff member's time. So Ms. Corbett Sanders and then Mr. Frisch. Great, thank you. And I'm sorry that we each are only getting three minutes, but I understand our time constraints. Uh, I've got a couple of different questions that I'm gonna put out there and then maybe we can have a, a dialogue. One, 50% um, of our students that uh, take advantage of the OSS services and in particular the alternative schools are ESOL students. I'm surprised that there isn't a um, more direct linkage between the work of this group and the ESOL and I'd like to better understand how that linkage works and whether or not we need to have um, a strengthening of the ESOL, ESOL supports in the OSS. Secondly, I'd like to better understand how we are going to address the needs of these students um, beyond just the summer's uh, engagement, but better understanding not only this summer, but going forward uh, for remediation and learning loss. Additionally, I'd like to better understand um, your thoughts on literacy, because we know that um, we have a significant uh, challenge and achievement gaps in literacy, especially uh, with our, uh, our newcomers, with our students of color and our students with disabilities. So I'd like to have a better understanding of how the OSS is directly supporting improvements in our literacy um, and the development of our literacy skills for all of our students and whether or not we need to have a more targeted approach within the OSS on literacy. And then finally, on the student-driven um, clubs, I appreciate Ms. Tolan's comments. I am a little concerned that when we have a pure, an approach which is purely based on student-driven, then that depends on a student knowing about um, different clubs and what could be made available. And so um, we really should make sure that there is a better way of ensuring um, consistency of club programming, especially at the middle school, and would like to understand how you would do that. With that, if I can get some responses, then we'll continue on. Thank you. I will uh, give it uh, the first crack here at a, at a couple things. Um, the first question around the linkage with ESOL and how we um, connect with them. So we do have ESOL staffing uh, within uh, the OSS teams and it's two uh, distinct groups. We have our ESOL uh, students uh, from our non-traditional schools and programs. And I would certainly want Ms. Salerno to um, chime in on that. I know she works um, very closely with uh, Rich Polio, who's our director of ESOL services. So there's a direct linkage with ISD there. And within our school support teams, our region support teams, we do have um, an e ESOL staffing. So one, one person that uh, works with our schools in that region around ESOL services, and they link directly with um, Rich Polio's office. And so they go to training, they participate in meetings, um, and actually take a lot of direction um, and influence on how they work with the ESOL kids from uh, his office. So that happens on a regular basis. I think there's actually uh, quite very strong cooperation there. It is something that we're getting better at. And now that, uh, again, as Dr. Presidio is the chief academic officer, so he is really bringing us all together to make sure that we are working uh, closer and we're more aligned than ever before. So some of these questions dovetail into OSS and ISD together, which I think is phenomenal. So I'm gonna continue to answer and then have other people try to support so I can get through all these. Um, the summer engagement and the learning loss are, we absolutely wanna make sure we continue um, with our summer work through next year. And you know whether we want to call it learning loss or 
you know, missed opportunities of, of learning, whatever, you know, nomenclature we use, we know this is going to be a several year period to get um, kids caught up with some of their mislearning um, and achievement gaps uh, in this area, in, in this time frame are going to be more pronounced. Uh, we were making incredible gains in that area, um, as evidenced by all our data over the past few years. And, and there, there are going to be some exaggerations with that. And how do we how do we close those? So we're going to take the work and the learning that we do from the summer. We're going to make sure that we're assessing kids on a regular and frequent basis to monitor those gaps throughout the school year. And then we're going to make sure that we're very, very um, strategic using our MTSS processes to make sure that we're giving kids the extra time and support they need. I think some of this to be very transparent it is not going to be a cookie cutter or a menu approach that we have right now. I think many of us are living through this and you know, we don't have the best metrics right now. You know, I'm just going to be honest about that. Um, you know, we've used SOLs traditionally to, I, that's my buzzer. Sorry. I can yeah. talk forever. Uh, folks, I do just want to add, we are running really tight on time and we've got at least six more board members who want to speak. So we're really going to have to do our best to be succinct here. Um, sorry. No, I know there's a lot of information, but we're just going to have to try and figure it out. Um, Ms. Corbisiana, did you have another question? Well, I don't think all of my questions have been asked, so I think they must go into um, follow on. But I am particularly concerned about the assessments and literacy um, in getting ahead of the game for next mm -hmm. fall. And so I would like to better understand what we are doing to support that. And then additionally, on the after school programming and the equity of access to the after school programming. And uh, I just want to tie in there the importance of not only ensuring school by school equity of access, but also equity of access for our special, uh, you know, our students who may attend public day schools or may um, attend an alternative school, but their base school may provide that. And so I would like to better understand how we can best support those students as well. So for the, the clubs, I can tell you, we can certainly publish a list to make sure there's more consistency and make sure students uh, know what those are. And we can work with principals and with uh, Mark Emery to make sure that from a middle school perspective, we are being more consistent. We'll definitely work on that. And I'll work with ISD on the literacy um, component to your question and what our assessment protocols are gonna be for identifying those gaps. And we'll get that written up and submitted to you. Not only identifying, but supporting our yes, students. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Ms. Uh, Mr. Frisch, followed by Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, just a few questions for Mr. Curran. Um, you mentioned in your comments um, the, that uh, our student athletes will uh, be receiving some form of diversity. Uh, equity, inclusion, and justice training. Can you talk a bit more about that and how you see that being budgeted? Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. We, um, we started the conversation, originally we started last summer around um, some of the things we were, we were certainly seeing on the outside and, and preparing our coaches and our students for dealing with that. That's internal work. So as far as budgeting goes, we have a, both a, uh, coaches education system that's internal as well as the resources we need right here to do it. Um, so really, as far as a cost goes, it's, I, I believe from what we're looking at, it's fairly nominal. There's um, some national resources available through the National Federation of High Schools, but frankly, I don't think those go far enough and they don't address yeah. anything we have right here. So really making it unique, working with Dr. Williams in her office and making that really specific for us. When do you anticipate that'll be uh, fully implemented? Our goal is August. That, that as we start the new the new uh, fall season on August 2nd, that all of our coaches, all of our staff, and our student athletes starting that fall season have completed it. We have other um, requirements that go with that, so we can loop it sure. right into that piece. And will that be required for every um, athletic sport? Yes. Athletic absolutely. sport. Look at me talking about <laughs> sports. <laughs> um, all uh, of athletes, all of our, our staff, all of our coaching staff, yes. Great. Uh, so on the on the subject of coaching staff, um, can you talk a bit about how our referees and umpires are certified? See, I know there's a difference between those two. 
And, and that's, it's, a, it's, it's another question. And we actually, you know, in light of some recent events, we work very closely with the Virginia High School League um, because while we contract with the officials, the Virginia High School League certifies them as capable to officiate our games. So they provide- Is it annual? It's, a, it's an annual yeah. certification that they have. And so- Excuse me, but, but can we try and keep this to budget related items, please? I'm getting there. Okay, oh, thank you. Yes. Through, the, through that process with the Virginia High School League in partnership with them, we're working on the development of that certification. Um, and uh, you see no anticipated additional costs there either? Um, not at this moment, I don't, because that, that's a partnership with the BHSL on a statewide level. And do the referees and umpires that service our games that are paid for by FCPS, as you indicated, um, are they responsible for paying for their own certification or is that not a paid function with VHSL. At this time, we're working through that with the Virginia High School League, so it's undetermined on this particular certification. I, well, on that specific certification, but on the current certification, yes. is that paid for by FCPS or by the, by the official individual? All right, and so the question is whether or not who would pay for this additional certification, whether it be the individual referee or umpire, VHSL or FCPS? It's, it, as a, the VHSL has a set list of, of requirements under certification and if they list it there then that's that's a requirement that would need to be completed by the association but we won't i don't want to use a double negative we will still require such a training even if vhsl does not include it in their requirements yes 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 and in that case do you anticipate that we would have the referees and umpires pay for the training or would fcps be required to pick up the bill on that I could probably the easiest way to answer is I anticipate the Virginia High School League will look at this as a statewide initiative. And right now I anticipate that it will be included under the statewide certification requirements by the Virginia High School League. So therefore it's their requirement and will not be a budget item for us. Well, fingers crossed, but I, I you know, I, I would love it if we had a backup plan just in case. Um, and I, for one, would certainly support any effort uh, if it required us to come up with some new money, you know, I think that'd be on the table as far as I'm concerned. But thank you. Thank you. And that too would be in place by August? That is, yes, that is the intention. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. McLaughlin, followed by Ms. Seismar-Heiser. Um, thanks, Ms. Marin. Um, and I do want to follow your guidance about this is a, a program budget. Um, discussion, and I, I do think board members are, are trying to do that as well. Um, I'm more concerned, I think, at a macro level, giving grace, of course, this is the first time we've done this for Dr. Brayburn and his team and for this board, but this presentation, like the previous ones, have felt too much like a program review and not a program budget. So in today's presentation, while I I'm a huge fan of Dr. Green, or Mr. Greenfelder's work and his team. Um, I would like to see um, as a follow-up more discussion um, specifically just about the return on investment on um, how we're running these programs and the budget implications. And one example I'll give is that um, as we have um, improved as a system not automatically reassigning students to alternative programs, but really looking at how do we keep students in their base schools where at all possible. Um, there's been a change in our enrollment in our alternative schools. And yet this presentation didn't talk at all about what we've seen that the budget implications and the changes and the costs that are associated with um, maintaining these um, traditional um, offerings of these programs uh, while we've tried to improve on not reassigning students um, to alternative settings. So that would just be one example where I think going forward, uh, what I would hope to see as a board member when we're talking about budgets and, and program budgets is um, having our superintendent's team do that analysis and say, when we, we look at the change in operations, this has a change in our programs, which has a change in maybe the way we're going to budget and, and do things going forward. So. Um, that's what I, I would want to see there. Um, and then I do um, want to echo the concerns um, that were well stated uh, in this the literacy and uh, programs 
uh, Mr. Greenfelder, I know this really probably falls in the camp of um, instructional services and Dr. Presidio's team, but the board is hearing some really great advocacy in our community um, led by the NAACP chapter on literacy and, and how Fairfax County Public Schools is actually um, tackling and improving from a best practice standpoint. So uh, I just want to use this opportunity to really spotlight that when we continuously improve in our literacy um, supports, it's also just literacy delivery. And uh, so I think we're gonna need to look at that. And, and Ms. Corbett Sanders, thank you for bringing up about, um, you know, making sure how do we do close those gaps and do those assessments in the absence of SOLs, how are we identifying where students are having literacy challenges? So um, overall, I have so many other questions uh, because it was a, a great presentation from, a, again, a program review standpoint. Kudos to your entire team. Um, Bill Curran, I have some thoughts about um, multi-sport athletes and why we see differences among the schools. And I think we've got to look at the poverty piece. I know at some of our more affluent schools, uh, students specialize into one sport. They're looking to go play at the collegiate level. And um, I think that that tends to sometimes see why there's a pressure to specialize where students can. They're on club teams. They're training at the at elite levels outside of the schools. And uh, I know from, from personal experience, students are actually discouraged to, pl to play multi-sport athletes if they really want to compete at the next level. So I think there's a lot to unpack with that, um, but I appreciate you bringing that up because it's something we should be looking into. And, uh, Finally, I know it's on the minds of this entire board um, about how we ensure not just our student athletes, but all of our students um, are going to have that diversity, equity, inclusion, um, education and, and training. Um, absolute proponent of what bill you're gonna get in place in August in light of recent community events. But I wanna make sure that oftentimes our athletes feel like they're kind of front and center in a spotlight sometimes. And, we want to make this available and, and, and encouraging it for all of our students too. So uh, Ms. Marin, I'm going to move off, but uh, I do think we, we've got to do a little bit more together as a board on how we make these more budget focused. Um, and it's just, it's a first step. Yeah, and I will add thank you for that reminder in a way because, um, you know, we had been ambitious in trying to schedule these monthly and um, Mr. Greenfelder has been prepared for, I think, two months with this presentation as we rescheduled and rescheduled because of other things, COVID and, and other related. Um, so on that note, we're not exactly sure when the next one's going to be. Um, we have a lot going on with this fiscal year development budget, returning to school. So right now, after today, there is not another one scheduled, but we will get back to the board with that information. Um, and also do note in board docs, there is a, a, a report up there, which Mr. Black, and I know you you particularly enjoy those. So that is up there as well for us to continue reading over and discuss at a future time. So True, um, but I, I would just say that we that the, the PowerPoint presentation and the way that guides board discussion really wasn't. I understand. Uh, yeah, I don't think yeah. it, it led us to be able to do that kind of analysis and conversation. So, okay. but again, no criticism, just. No, understood. Yeah. Moving and forward. the challenge of our speaking time too, you know, three minutes, two minutes, and we're, we're rushing as, as always, but we wanted to try and hit that 1245 timeline today so that the public engagement committee could also have an hour and 45 minutes that topic. So that's why we're doing this at this yeah, clip. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Um, next, we have Ms. Karen keys Gamara. Oh, excuse me, no, Ms. Sizemore Heiser, followed by Ms. keys Gamara. Great, thank you, Ms. Marin. Um, and I, I agree with Ms. McLaughlin that I appreciate all the hard work from OSS and Mark Greenfelder and his office, but I do agree that this feels more like a program review than a budget review. And again, no criticism, but I think if we do this again next year, that's just some you know um, constructive, constructive work to sort of adjust as we move forward with this. So I, I wanted to say that. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate all of your hard work and this presentation and all the details. I have lots of questions. I, I'm sure I won't get to all of them, but I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the student activities and programs, kind of starting on slide 20 ish. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate the breakdown of the different positions and um, the breakdown of the connection to the strategic plan and the portrait of the student athlete. But I have to ask 
the office is af activities and athletics, but it feels like 90% of the presentation when you dig in the details is about athletics. I know there's, um, you know, ISD operates and uh, the co-curriculars which have after school, but I'd really like to see, for example, I would love to see a portrait of a student, um, engaged student who's engaged in activities. So I just would wonder if you could talk a little bit more to what are we going to do to sort of have a similar infrastructure around activities that we do around sports. We've all seen during the pandemic and the fact that many of our students aren't returning to in-person learning, the real vital importance of engagement and connection, which these clubs do. So that's the first piece. And the second piece I want to ask is, is there funding to continue our clubs, uh, at least some of them in this hybrid sort of format or virtual? Because I do believe, and I'd like someone to comment on this, that um, the students in our non-traditional schools have less access to activities and sports. And I'm wondering if there's budget room or CARES funding act to get them also engaged and get better access, either using hybrid or virtual or expanding to those schools. So if someone could comment on those pieces first, I'd appreciate it. So I will try to, to do this uh, really quick. I think um, the first piece on the other clubs and activities and our, um, you know, our marching band, our, our choir or chorus, all those different activities that kids are um, involved in that traditionally uh, come through ISD. Um, again, under Dr. Presidio's leadership, he is asking us to be um, more coordinated in that approach and, and how we could report that out. So I think we, we can definitely do a better job with that next year. And some of these things are intertwined. So mm -hmm. that might be a piece where we can work with our ISD colleagues, um, with, with Noel Clemenko and her and I can do some of this jointly so that you can see um, what the benefit is of those, how many kids are participating in those types of things. I think that would be very beneficial. So we will absolutely look to do a better job. It, it is more um, sports and um, clubs type related because that's really what we oversee. Um, but we'll make sure that we do a much better job of, of that in the future. For the funding of clubs, um, to continue in a virtual environment, I'll work with uh, Mr. Kern and with Dr. Presidio, and you know we'll we'll see if we need any additional funding for that. But I do believe um, it, it's not going to be difficult to continue some of these in a virtual environment, and we will certainly get and make a request for any additional funding that we need. So I'll, we'll make that a priority and work on that later this week. Great, thank you. And I just wanted to I appreciate that, and I know some of the co-curriculars are under ISD, but what I'm I guess I'm looking for is you know, is there a parity to have central office staff to really support robust clubs? You know, is there a way to have clubs that provide opportunities for students who may not be able to give up an elective or are special ed students who don't have an elective to give up to be able to have similar, you know, chorus, band, art, CTE, some of those experiences in clubs. So, you know, we talk a lot about athletes and, and the portrait of a graduate from an athlete. I really think there's room here to have opportunities for students who can't traditionally access these programs to develop those same skills. And that's where I guess I'm looking for some conversation, whether it's budgetary or staffing or whatever, to have sort of some equity there. And especially for our non-traditional schools, our special ed students. I mean, these kids may not have an elective to do. Totally things. agree. And we'll, we'll work on that. It's both budgetary and staffing and the two are intertwined, but I think getting some more direct um, support and oversight so that we make sure we have a strong structure in place to do exactly what you're articulating. And we can certainly work with you and others offline in, into what your vision of that is and work with Dr. Presidio to make that happen. Thank you, I appreciate that. And, and the only other piece I'll put out there is, is sort of somewhat, somewhat equity and stipending as well. You know, I know we stipend our coaches. Do we have budgetary to stipend teachers to do some of these things after school? And that's, you know, even if it's temporary for next year to get kids reengaged. So that's the first piece I just wanted to put out there. And I appreciate your willingness to sort of talk offline more about sort of what I'm envisioning here and what my thoughts are, especially for our non-traditional schools. Um, I'm sure you, you know, I'm gonna ask this on page 31, I think it's slide 31, let me make sure, of the report, you say, um, it's slide 31, certain students graduate with a diploma. Um, can you tell me which diploma that is? So 87% of 12th grade students graduate with a diploma um, that are in non-traditional school programs and 93% of 12th grade students graduate in homebound graduate with a diploma. Do you know which diploma that is? And I think that was the bell. Is that right, Ms. Smolberg? Ms. Salerno, I'm gonna need you to yes. field that one for me. Thank you, happy to answer. <clears throat> so that is either a standard diploma, advanced diploma or an adult high school diploma. Okay. Um, any of the three there. But not an applied studies diploma or a modified diploma. 
No, Great. that's that's yeah. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. We'll Thank also you. break those out in the future so you know what the uh, what those are. Thank you. Great. School board members, if you've spoken, can you please lower your hands? I see about four hands up of people who already spoken. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Kiskamara, followed by Ms. Omesh. Thank you. Um, I, I, I should preface my comments by saying um, I agree with the, um, the number of my co colleagues who mentioned that we don't have enough focus here on breaking out the budgetary uh, implications of what we're doing. And I say that particularly because I, I recall we had a rather extensive um, presentation uh, from the same same department back in I think November, I, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I'm uh, struggling to try to figure out how to uh, put the information we have today into context uh, with respect to the budgetary decisions that we need to make going forward. So many of my comments have to do with what additional information I would like. I wanna give you that context. Con uh, context. Um, we hear lots of uh, focus on the word equity. Um, uh, that was repeated uh, again and again, but I'm looking for what particular investments we have made to address identified inequities as well as data to support that. Now, I realize that may be um, you know, seen as two different things, but I feel I can't really make um, a good argument or evaluate what we're looking at without that type of assessment. Um, I would say um, there, there was a mention of the region teams. And again, that's a great opportunity, I think, to break that out where we have identified inequities. Um, <clears throat> there was also mention of PSAT administration. I know that we do this all the time, um, but I would certainly like to know whether where that is being administered um, more fully who has greater access and what we are doing about it and what investment that would require. Um, in terms of the data, how has the development changed on the impact of our students and their ability to access more curriculum? Um, that is another overall question. With respect to athletics, I think um, we've all kind of mentioned um, the, you know, it's situations that have arisen recently. Um, I saw the tie to the strategic plan, but in practice, how are we uh, promoting uh, accountability in this area? I, I, I believe my colleague, Mr. Frisch mentioned uh, inclusivity, inclusivity training, et cetera. Um, but I, that concerns me to some extent because we can do the training, but the real problem has to do with the, um, the impact and, and the practice. And so those are just a few examples of how I'd like to be able to tie the budgetary investment because we did establish a, a, an entire new department. Um, and certainly we need to be able to evaluate our return on investment for that. Those are my comments. I'm happy to, if you wanna expound. Sure, um, so mm -hmm. thank you for those. So I'm just gonna kind of go down in order as quickly as I can and, and ask for others to um, chime in. Most of this, we'll, we'll, we could certainly get additional information for you and put in a written response, um, especially when you're talking about um, identifying um, the investments and how do we show that that's paying off, we can certainly certainly show you where we've closed gaps and some of those things on an academic, um, in an academic as aspect. I think it's easy to show the region teams, how they're constructed by region and where there are, uh, maybe one region has an additional position or not. Primarily it's regions two and three have one additional position. Um, and that was funded uh, last year. Um, 
from the athletics perspective and in practice, I think you're hundred percent correct. We can do all the training uh, that we want, but how do you um, have some accountability in that? And I think one of the things we need to look at is from an athletic standpoint is when uh, <coughs> infractions happen, what are we gonna do in terms of making sure that uh, at least in the athletics and other activities, um, folks are held accountable for their behavior. So that is certainly something that we can work on and we will work on with Dr. Williams. So just to clarify, if it's needed at all, prior to the development of this department, we heard a lot about project momentum and we saw a lot of data. And mm -hmm. we, we saw this department uh, giving us the promise of spreading that across the county and addressing identified inequities. I don't see those identified inequities in this report at all. And I'm not able to tie the improvements uh, based on what this investment has been. That is my overall concern. And I think that that is something we need to be able to present, not just to this board, but to the community. So um, going forward, I look forward to um, addressing those concerns. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Gamara, for that, those thoughts. Um, Ms. Omesh, followed by Ms. Cohen. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to staff for um, sharing some of the, the developments and program efforts that have been going on. Um, I, I share a number of you know, the concerns and thoughts my colleagues have, have articulated. Um, I did want to point out, you know, one of the things I that, that I noticed more so than other departments we've been reviewing is, you know, a number of positions that are administrators or assistants or managers and a lot of kind of admin roles, um, even in maybe smaller offices. Uh, I, I was just curious if you can speak a little bit to some of the strategic thinking that, that goes into deciding how these resources are allocated. Um, I know that's kind of what we were hoping for today with the, the budget, the purpose of it being a budget conversation, but I do want to give you the space to, to flesh that out a little bit because um, I'm feeling a bit at a loss and, and wanting to understand that. Sure. If we, and if we want to, if you want some follow-up, if you can, if you let me know which positions in particular that you would like some additional detail on, I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, as the department was created and the different offices came in, as you know, many central offices trade for positions. Um, I would say if you, if you look at other uh, departments and offices within them compared to us, um, they actually have far more resources. Um, you know, for an example, I have uh, two directors that we had to actually trade um, just to have one single AA um, for, for those uh, directors. So they didn't even ha have an administrative assistant. So again, when we look at what are the needs um, and, and if we're trading for a position, we're certainly doing so in a very strategic manner in a very budget conscious manner. Um, and, and I think we operate actually on less than what other people have. So I'd need to know what are the specific positions that you're looking for. I'm happy to give you a detailed response of what those um, folks do. It's just, again, it was very hard. And, you know, even at 15 minutes per office, um, that takes us to an hour. Um, and we tried to keep it in 45 minutes or less. So it's just really hard to give you that amount of detail in a short time. So I'm happy to follow up with any um, specific questions that you have on a position. Yeah, I mean, it's not so much a specific position. Again, I think, you know, division or office wide, um, thinking about how things are prioritized, what are the factors that go in your strategic thinking? I mean, for one, I, I'm, I'm thinking in particular about, you know, how I would prefer to see some school based, uh, more school based positions, right, given how low some of those ratios are, or even knowing that some principals have to pay for some of the reading specialists and math specialists out of their own budgets to support students in academics, which is ultimately the most important thing we're doing. So, can, I mean, can you speak to that? Are there guiding values? Is there a process? Um, we don't, every, almost all of our staff is school-based. So I think that's one of the things that, you know, there may be a misconception. So all of our resource teachers spend 80% of their time supporting schools. Um, at least 80% of their time, they're out in buildings. So when you talk about the literacy specialists that are on um, the region teams, for example, or the math specialists, they are working at the schools within those regions, working with teachers, working with teacher teams, um, working with student groups, 
on a on a regular basis. So, um, you know, if anything, I would need more of the, more of those folks, just like everybody needs more more resources. So, the primary folks that that support our office, same thing with non traditional schools. You know, those folks are out in schools working with students. Um, and so we can certainly, I can certainly try to get you more detailed information on that if that if that's what you're looking for. I think I, hopefully that answers it a little bit better. I, the people aren't yep. sitting around in the office, they're out in schools. You know, Ms. Omesh, this is Dr. Brabrand. Just to piggyback on some comments you made to Ms. Keith Gamara, there's two nuggets. One, we have needs-based staffing, over $20, $30 million in needs-based staffing that goes to schools based on FRM. Then OSS has taken traditionally the SOL performance of the school, including looking at gap groups, to classify schools as intensive um, and a whole tiered process. Now, one of the things, Ms. Keys Gamara, that happened this year, we didn't have the SOLs. So I, I think, Mr. Greenfelder, one of the things the board may want to know is how did we disperse staff this year without all that rich SOL data? And I think we can follow up to explain that. We are giving the SOLs uh, this year, of course, and those, those families that are not coming in in person for the SOL will have a remote assessment and we'll use that data to drive the distribution of the OSS teams. But I think that's one thing we can talk about. How did we distribute those resource teachers in schools this year um, mm -hmm. and what that work looked like? And we can do that in the follow-up. Yeah, I mean, do we know even, you know, even if it's just a, a feeling or a sense of what percentage, for example, you know, we have school based versus other or. Well, I mean, like I like I said, the the needs based staffing is twenty five, thirty million dollars. I'd have to go back to look at the OSS amount, Mark, of your the region teacher teams, uh, maybe just a couple of million. They're distributed through the region based on traditionally based on the SOL performance. This year, Mark, do you want to just speak to uh, how yeah, we did it this year without having that the benefit of the SOL uh, results? Yeah, we still use some of the same previous data, data that we've used before and to deploy that. But really it comes from, we have a region EP that is assigned uh, and oversee, helps oversee those teams. And so basically the region team works with region leadership to see where the needs are in their region. So that's one of the advantages of going from the traditional project momentum where we just worked with the most at-risk schools to now a more region-based where we were trying to get support to all schools. So the region leadership through a tiered approach really has said, you know, school X over here needs more support and literacy. So that's where we make sure that those resources go. Um, but we still use, you know, some of the, the previous data that we have, because if you were at the lowest tier, it's highly unlikely that that shifted over this, you know, over this period of time. If anything, that may have grown. So we've made sure that those supports have stayed um, as consistent as possible. And, and Ms. Omesh, one, one last thing just to say on this. One thing this team does, uh, an elementary school uh, struggling with math, they do a walkthrough with the teachers. These are outstanding teachers in their craft. They do a walkthrough of math instruction. Then they meet with those teachers and the principal. What do you see that's working well? What could have been different? And so they're building instructional capacity in the school. They say, hey, we'll come back in a couple of weeks. We'll check in. How's it going? Is it getting better? Mm -hmm. um, if it's not, here's some more things to work on. Mark's convened a whole gathering, the principals there, the assistant principals, the teachers, the OSS team. It's almost, it, it's this community conversation. Hey, this is what good instruction is. Here's what we saw. Here's what we didn't see. That kind of accountability is what, was in the project momentum model. And that's what we've been expanding to all of our region schools. And yes, we're asking our region assistant superintendent executive principals, where are the schools based on the data, based on parent calls? Hey, what's going on with math instruction here? What's going on with literacy? To take a deeper dive in those classrooms and give real time recommendations. And they can go over to another school for a couple of days, but come back the following week and check up and see is this instruction happening the way we believe it should? So that is a powerful piece that Mark's team has been doing and that we've expanded by creating this department. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, you know, with a lot of this work and from what I've been hearing, there, there's a lot of, I mean, I struggle with the kind of the general, this is what we're doing, this is what, you know, our goals are, a, no, a number of slides talking about how equity is important. We share these values, and I think, you know, there are some intuitive, there's an intuitive sense of what we do, but I think the level of specificity, the analysis, um, you know, having ways of how we're being appropriate stewards of the resources that are ultimately, um, you know, allocated for this purpose, that, that's where I'm trying to see some more rigor in, in how we're evaluating what's going on, um, to even, you know, to think of how we prioritize this. I do think that this office and this conversation today would benefit from uh, some perspective from equity. I know the equity team has to be <laughs> looped into everything and they're overburdened with so much, but I do think there's, you know, we need to have that bird's eye view look, which I would, you know, I was hoping we'd have today, but we can do in the future of really uh, looking at the analysis. I mean, I, again, school accreditation, um, SOL pass rates or gaps, those are metrics, but the picture is a fuller picture. Sure. And, and, and those I mean, I don't want to just care about schools not being, you know, kicked off or, or being, you know, uh, having accreditation issues. Sure, right? sure. So, and, um, and we added that equity person to the team just a year ago or two years ago. Mark could, could give you for sure when. We added that equity in. And yes, we need to go beyond just SOLs. Now there's all these different metrics around equity that we need to take a look at. And we have an equity specialist in with that region team helping give schools feedback. This budget piece, looking at the budget of this department, is not the same as a presentation on how is OSS doing the work in the schools. That's what I hear you saying as board members. You want to know that nuts and bolts more. How's it working? There's two teachers at this elementary school from Mark's team helping third grade at Woodley Hills get kids better in literacy. They have that level of detail. They have a track to the hour of where people are, what they're doing and who they're doing it with. And we'll find a way to give you that kind of detail um, uh, moving forward so that you can absolutely understand what they're doing, how they're doing it and what results they're getting. Right, and, and in addition to that question, what justifies you know, the, the persisting decisions that we're making? Um, if right. we're even making them actively, you know, it might just be that we've had it, this is the way it's gone and this is the office and these are the staff. But we, we really need to be doing the thinking, um, you know, proactively to see, all right, is this the best use of the resources? Right. Can we repurpose this? Can we be more creative? Is there a new way of doing this or a different way? Or, you know, or should we channel our energies towards making sure that certain ratios are addressed? That th there's got to be a vision to it. Yeah. Well, there, the, the, the vision, though, just to all of you, the vision is we've given out needs-based staffing for 25 years. How come we haven't closed the gap? You can have the staffing, but it's got to be aligned to best practices. It's got to be aligned to equitable practices. Mark's team are the, if you want to call it, the inspectors. We're going to go in. They're also the developers. You know what? We came in and inspected this. We need to develop your talent around math instruction, reading instruction, particularly in elementary where we're asking teachers to be experts in multiple subject areas, but also in middle and high school too. We have secondary experts and elementary experts. The part that we can do and we will is really help you understand the how more of what they're doing. And we'll figure out the right way working with the chair and vice chair to share that with you on two by twos or for a full board presentation. It is very impressive the level of detail they have. And they do, they look at new data all the time to help inform where they should be putting people, uh, where people, hey, the school's got it now. We don't need to come check in on them every week, every month. We can go somewhere else. So great questions. Yeah. And I mean, this is, you know, the second presentation on this particular topic. I think having that specificity really is, is necessary um, for any future conversation. My, my final question really was, I, I saw that we had a financial analyst in central office supporting. Um, can, can you speak a little bit more to what the, what that, you know, what people, what that person does? Yeah, that person um, is absolutely critical so we didn't we don't have anybody that does budget or or manages any of the programs especially from non-traditional schools when they were part of um when they were part of our special ed services they had they were part they have a whole team over there that manages all all the budgetary um implications um managers the grant funding uh making sure you're in compliance all of those type things so this 
and it was recommended as a best practice by financial services that we have somebody that, that comes over as most, I think every department within Fairfax County has uh, folks that are budget experts within their office. We did not have one. And so that's what we, that we that's why we got a person uh, that has that. It, had we had had more time, we probably would have had that in the original um, creation, but we didn't. So we traded for that uh, particular position for this year. So it's absolutely critical. I mean, right, I, yeah. I mean, we, we didn't have anybody to do the budget. So that's as the, probably one of the most important things you can do is make sure you're being a good steward of your, your finances and your money. And there's you know quite a bit of funding that runs through these. And we wanna make sure we're being um, you know compliant and, and due diligence and best practices. And so we made sure we had somebody. And again, that was recommended by financial services as well to make sure that we had somebody to help us with that. Yeah, I mean, I'd appreciate the specificity again. Is this someone looking back, looking forward, making doing analysis, making decisions, or is this just a man, a budget manager? I think they do all of those things that you mentioned. They they're looking forward to make sure are we are how are we using our funding? Is it, our funding being strategic? Uh, for example, how are we uh, deploying our funds to schools? Are we are you know I have a conversation with that that person on a weekly basis about you know. Is, is our budget in line with our vision? Are we making sure that we're getting the supports to the, to the right schools um, with our own proposal when schools ask for funding? Um, but, but a lot of it, to be quite honest with you, is very compliance driven um, with the large number of grants and different things that we have. Just like any office has you know, folks and staff that do that, we have one, that's it. And that person is um, quite overwhelmed, to be honest with you. Appreciate the honesty um, and hope, you know, in our future conversation, maybe some of that thinking can be, it's an opportunity for us to have that conversation. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, folks, we've flown past our 1245 stop time, but let's uh, finish with whoever hasn't spoken yet first. So um, Ms. Cohen, um, followed by Ms. Pekarski, and then Dr. Anderson, and then Ms. Kofax. So everyone wants to speak and we have five minutes till break. So. Um, I'm just trying to think how we want to do this. Um, Dr. Anderson, do you have any suggestions on how to keep this going here on task? I, um, I, I, I'm happy to offer something because um, that's what I was going to say in my turn. Clearly, we don't have time to do what we want to do here. I see a need for some greater discussions that are not necessarily budget-based, but just around this department and its work. Mm -hmm. um, so I would suggest that we find opportunity to do that, even if it's not a whole board discussion, maybe it's a two by two with Mr. Greenfelter and appropriate yeah. persons, but we definitely, I have questions that I'm not even going to pose because we are against the clock at this time. That would be what I suggest so that we could have the break at one, come back and finish PEC because we know we have closed afterwards, but there's a lot of outstanding um, discussion that needs to happen. And mm -hmm. it's great work. We just haven't time for it at this point. Yeah, I mean, that's my well, I, of the four of you who had your hands up, I see three of you, I think, nodding. Yes, let's just, I think, continue another time. I'm not sure I could take a pulse, but you know, I also just want to queue up for the next set of people we were really productive when we kept it to two minutes um, during a budget work session a few weeks ago. And I would love for us, I'll leave it to the next meeting managers to queue that up, but I really hope that we can be succinct. This is really tough to facilitate on a new platform, no less. And people, I see more hands going up for people who already spoke. So we're gonna, um, I guess what I'd like to do is uh, take a poll to end at one, take the one the half hour lunch break and then convene with PECs uh, with that topic and then we'll have to figure out when this gets rolled in Dr. Anderson perhaps this is part of the discussions we want to have about strategic planning about future budget um, whether it's two by two or some portion of the budget committee you know I don't know but we're not going to figure it all out now so um so can I please um, if you could all lower your hands and I've gotten I've got who uh, was still remaining to talk in case that passes but um, please, if you could indicate that we Is take there... a break. Excuse me, I'd like to call this question. Um, if we could, if you could please raise your hand if you agree to take a break from one to one thirty and reconvene as planned on the PEC topic. So, if you could raise your hand if you agree to 
um, take the break from 1 to 1.30 and reconvene um, with the PEC topic as planned. And we're using that little raise hand icon. So I've got um, Dr. Anderson, Ms. Seismar Heiser, Ms. Tolan, Mr. Frisch, Ms. Paparski, I'm six. So are we deadlocked then? Six want to take a break and six do not. Ms. Marin, I'd like to be recognized to just give it a quick solution for, for your consideration as the meeting manager. Um, sure, for, the board members, for the board members who didn't speak, I, I certainly support that we give them two minutes each. Staff isn't going to speak to their questions. Um, and then at least they get the privilege of sharing their thoughts and views. Well, we could certainly we can certainly vote for that. I will say that um, I think that it's unfair that some people got to talk a lot, and now the last people only get to talk for two minutes. So, well, Ms. Marin, um, I agree. I think it's, I a, I think it's a natural. Con let let's vote time. on it, but I, but I think it is a natural consequence for how we behave. Is that we uh, run Ms. out? Ms. Marin, I will be happy to yield my time. I will ask my questions in another forum. I do think we need to come back and find another opportunity for us to be comprehensive in this discussion. Outside of moving the PEC off of the agenda, we are not going to accomplish this this afternoon. So I suggest we just take a pause and regroup and find another space for us to be fully I, um, have the opportunity to fully have our questions answered. And, and I, I, I don't want to speak. Yes, and I, as as meeting manager, we have been meeting now for three hours. We have not taken one break, and that's also a very poor practice. So um, I don't know if I <laughs> do. I override this. I mean, what we're going to vote again and spend ten minutes voting? I mean, Miss Miss Marin, I am the co meeting yeah. manager, and I've not spoken. And I would like to say I think it is for those board members who at least want to publicly for their colleagues to hear their questions or to hear their, I think it's important that we allow that, whether we take a break now because it, there is a need at time to take a break and then reconvene with everybody stating their questions succinctly and say these answers can be given in next steps. But what otherwise- What is your proposal then? Then what is your proposal? My proposal please? is to take a break now. Anyone who hasn't spoken, allow them to speak um, allow us to speak um, for a two minute duration um, and have rather than wait for staff to answer your questions, have them answered in next steps. Because it's, that it's, really way tough to not, it's really that tough to not be on the same page as co meeting. Ms. Marin, Ms. Dana Kofax, if I may, I think it is one o'clock. We don't need to make a sausage right now. I would Thank definitely you. agree to pausing and then we could, re we could reconvene at um, 1.30 with the plan that I think Ms. Um, Darren Koufax has shared. I'd right like now, we do that, need please. to pause. I think like to we vote just need to have a break. Sure, I'd like to pause and vote on that at 1.30. That's fine, let's just come back enough. at 1.30. Let's pause and figure it out. Everybody Great. have so a good lunch. Until 1.30, thank you.